If you want to see how the free market really works, this is the place to come. Hong Kong, a place with hardly any natural resources. About the only one you can name is a great harbor. Yet the absence of natural resources hasn't prevented rapid economic development. When Milton Friedman rode on this ferry in 1980, Hong Kong was not a part of China, but was leased to Britain as a colony. And it had just made an incredible journey, one that demonstrated to the world that even the poorest countries can develop. After the Second World War and the Communist Revolution in China, this rock in the middle of nowhere became a refugee camp with millions of extremely poor people. To Milton Friedman, the scientist, this was a perfect natural experiment to test his theory about free markets. Hong Kong had no prospects, no natural resources and little land that could be cultivated. But almost by accident, it was given economic freedom. The British government couldn't be bothered with local Hong Kong affairs. And the governor here happened to favor free markets. So Hong Kong never introduced all those policies that other governments did. No tariffs, no regulations or government intervention in the economy. So the economy could evolve in a natural way. As a result, Hong Kong became an economic powerhouse. When Friedman came to Hong Kong in 1980, it could boast statistics on life expectancy and infant mortality that equaled Western countries. Incredibly, it was on its way to become richer than its colonial ruler, Britain. This thriving, bustling, dynamic city has been made possible by the free market. Indeed, the freest market in the world. The free market enables people to go into any industry they want, to trade with whomever they want, to buy in the cheapest market around the world, to sell in the dearest market around the world. But, most important of all, if they fail, they bear the cost. If they succeed, they get the benefit. And it's that atmosphere of incentive that has induced them to work, to adjust, to save, to produce a miracle. And what a miracle it's been. Friedman was standing next to the tallest building on the skyline. And just look at that skyline now. There are more skyscrapers here than in all of New York City. Between 1950 and 2000, Hong Kong's GDP per capita increased more than 10 times. Friedman concluded that this success was due to the free market. This hasn't been achieved by government action by someone sitting in one of those tall buildings telling people what to do. It's been achieved by allowing the market to work. The complete absence of tariffs or any other restrictions on trade is one of the main reasons why Hong Kong has been able to provide such a rapidly rising standard of life for its people. In 1980, when Milton Friedman wanted to see a truly free market, he had to come here, to Hong Kong. Since then, much of the world has followed in Hong Kong's path. In an effort to get out of its stagnation of the 1970s, the US and Western Europe began to return to the ideals of free competition. Taxes were lowered, tariffs were reduced, and regulations slashed. Hong Kong is now part of China, but at times it seems more like Hong Kong took over China rather than the other way around. The communist leaders on the mainland, they looked around at their more successful neighbors and then decided to set their own markets free. And Asia's other giant, India, they also opened their economy to the rest of the world. In Eastern Europe, communism collapsed because the economy never could satisfy the needs of the people and they were longing for freedom. In 1991, in the small Baltic country of Estonia, Prime Minister Mart Lahr took his inspiration from Milton Friedman's book, Free to Choose, which was based on the TV series. He decided to imitate the Hong Kong model, with zero tariffs, a flat tax, and a minimum of regulation. Despite his problems with the 2008 financial crisis, 
Estonia is widely seen as the most successful of the former communist economies. Free markets have spread around the world. At the same time, we've seen the fastest human progress ever. And it has been led by the countries that opened up their economies. In fact, average incomes around the world have almost doubled. Think about these statistics. Globally, extreme poverty has been more than half since Milton Friedman did his series in 1980. Amazingly, 730 million people have been liberated from poverty. Every year, life expectancy around the world has increased by three months, despite AIDS and despite malaria. And to me, one of the most heartening facts is that the risk of parents losing their child in infancy has almost been cut in half. These were the results that Friedman predicted free markets could bring about. As people got more wealthy, they could begin to deal with the most important challenges in their lives. But Friedman had another reason why he wanted authoritarian dictatorships to liberalize their economies. Political freedom. Human and political freedom has never existed and cannot exist without a large measure of economic freedom. Those of us who have been so fortunate as to have been born in a free society tend to take freedom for granted, to regard it as a natural state of mankind. It is not. It is a rare and precious thing. He thought that economic freedom would directly lead to political freedom. When people begin to make their own decisions and gain confidence in their ability to take care of themselves, Friedman believed they would begin to demand personal and political freedoms as well. When we say that a market is free, it sounds a bit like a dog-eat-dog -dog economy. But that is not what Friedman had in mind. He thought that the best explanation of why the free market works was developed more than 200 years ago in Scotland, where Adam Smith taught at the University of Glasgow. Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, explains why free choice and voluntary association is often more well-functioning and orderly than commands from the top. Voluntary association is what we do together of our own free will. When these people buy and sell to each other, and none is subject to force or fraud, that is voluntary association. It is anything that is going on between consenting adults. When you visit marketplaces around the world, they can sure look like chaos, but underneath the surface, it is highly organized, not from above, but by people's own interests and actions. Friedman thought that Adam Smith had the answer. Adam Smith's flash of genius was to see how prices that emerged in the market, the prices of goods, the wages of labor, and the cost of transport, could coordinate the activities of millions of independent people, strangers to one another, without anybody telling them what to do. His key idea was that self-interest could produce an orderly society benefiting everybody. It was as though there were an invisible hand at work. What did Adam Smith mean by self-interest and an invisible hand? By self-interest, he wasn't thinking of greed, just taking what you can get. He was thinking of the day-to-day -day decisions that we all make to better our lives. The clothes we wear, what car we drive, even whether we like our fish really fresh. The market tells producers not only what to produce, but how best to produce it through another set of prices. The cost of materials, the wages of labor, and so on. Walk down any street in Hong Kong and you'll see the impersonal forces of the market in operation. If I want to buy a tomato, I could buy one right here at the market from Hung Choi. But if everybody suddenly wanted to buy tomatoes, perhaps because we get new information about how good they are for our health, well, then there would be too few tomatoes. So, on choice, suppliers would have to charge him more. In that case, I have to pay more to lay my hands on one. If prices increase, farmers will notice. Without knowing us, or without even having heard about the new health information, they can see with their own eyes that they would make more money if they produce tomatoes rather than, say, broccoli. And in that case, more farmers will move into tomato production and the supply will be increased. 
Hung Choi's costs are reduced, and in order to sell more tomatoes than his competitors, he once again starts charging less for tomatoes. At that point, no more farmers are tempted to move into that line of work. When I buy a tomato, and when someone else is buying some fish, we control the supply on the market. We vote with our pocketbooks, and all around the world, people spring into action to satisfy our demands. Every purchase sends a message. This is how the market economy works in every sector, from tomatoes to apples to Apple computers. And this is Adam Smith's invisible hand. To make your life better, you have to better the lives of others. Invisible hands are all around us. Friedman borrowed an example from economist Leonard Reed to show that something that we take for granted and use every day is the result of a complex interaction between thousands of people. Look at this lead pencil. There's not a single person in the world who could make this pencil. Remarkable statement? Not at all. The wood from which it's made, for all I know, comes from a tree that was cut down in the state of Washington. To cut down that tree, it took a saw. To make the saw, it took steel. To make the steel, it took iron ore. But obviously, the pencil is no longer one of our most important tools of communication. This is. And the production of a smartphone is not less complex, to say the least. This display is made in Japan. And the camera in Vietnam. The microphones come from Austria and the chipset from France. The memory is produced in Korea and the battery in China. And the software and design centers are all over the world in countries like India, Finland, Britain and the US. Thousands of people on several continents cooperated to make these phones so that we could have them. People from different countries, different cultures, people who had never even met. That is why the operation of the free market is so essential, not only to promote productive efficiency, but even more to foster harmony and peace among the peoples of the world. We have a choice of smartphones, tomatoes, even trucks, because of competition. Sometimes the price is too high, sometimes the product doesn't work, and sometimes the service is lousy. But in that case, someone else can enter the market and take all the customers. So every company has to offer us something better to stay in business. Some succeed, but some fail. And it's that risk of failure that really scares us. When a businessman faces trouble, a market threatens to disappear, or a new competitor arises, there are two things he can do. He can turn to the government for a tariff or a quota or some other restriction on competition, or he can adjust and adapt. In Hong Kong, the first option is closed. Hong Kong is too dependent on foreign trade so that the government has simply had to adopt a policy of complete non-interference. That's tough on some individuals, but it's extremely healthy for the society as a whole. Only the businessmen who can adapt, who are flexible and adjustable, survive, and they create good employment opportunities for the rest. So this is the kind of boxes that you were producing here when Milton Friedman came by to visit? Mr. Chung makes metal containers. Nobody's ordered him to. He does it because he's found that he can do better for himself that way than by making anything else. But if demand for metal containers went down, Mr. Chung would soon get that message. And Mr. Jung is still here. And nowadays he produces more things for the tourist trade, 